Ladies and gentlemen, uh, my name is Damien Chalmers. I'm head of the European Institute here at the London School of Economics and Political Science. It's my uh, task to welcome you to this marvellous event, which is the latest in our perspectives on Europe series. It's one of a number of events we have marking the events of 1989. Now, I'll get down in about 30 seconds, and my next job is really to introduce you to our chair, and there's no one better to do it than Ed Lucas, who's furthest on your right as you're looking at it, who's one of the most distinguished and well-known journalists who has talked about the events of that time and about the region. So, Ed, over to you. Well, thanks very much indeed um, to uh, LSE for inviting us and to the ambassadors of Poland, the Czech Republic, Slovakia, Hungary and Germany. Um, for organising it and making it happen. It's uh, wonderful to be here. Um, the title is Have Our Dreams Come True? And mine certainly has. I'm reminded of a, when I was a student here in 1982, um, we had a big meeting here to discuss martial law in Poland. And I think if anybody had told us then that uh, 27 years later we would be discussing 20 years on from the fall of the Berlin Wall, we'd have been wondering what they were putting in the coffee and the brunch bowl. Um, that this would be an unimaginably wonderful outcome. Um, as, a, as a student, a former student here, I guess you can all read, um, so I'm not going to give you a complete um, readout of these um, exceptionally distinguished biographies. Um, we have a president, we have former prime ministers, former foreign ministers, um, but in a way I think what's more important than their biographies from after the fall is from before the fall, because they all contributed in their different ways to the fall of the Iron Curtain and the reunification of Europe. I remember when I first went to Czechoslovakia, as it was then as a correspondent in 1989, seeing someone had written with their finger in the grime of a window, Svoboda Havlovi, freedom for Havel, because uh, Václav Havel then was a political prisoner. One of my first big stories was covering the trial where he was uh, let out for good behavior, I believe. And at the end of that year, he was elected president. And I, you haven't come to hear me, um, so I'm going to um, go straight on in. I just want to remind you, please, to turn off your mobile phones, because much of we love those theme tunes, and some of you may even have the national anthems of East European countries, rather wonderful <laughs> things on your mobiles. We don't want to hear them um, right here. We're going to have a discussion for roughly an hour, then questions from the, um, uh, from the audience, and I hope you'll be able to phrase your points as tersely and incisively as possible. This isn't a time for um, long speeches. And at the end, we are invited to a, a drinks reception in the atrium. And I hope you know where that is. It was built since, since my time here. Um, so I'm going to start off um, by asking all the panellists just to give us a very quick outline of what their greatest uh, pleasant surprise has been, which dream has come true, and which dream hasn't come true. And when we've had those opening remarks, we'll then get into a discussion and see whether we agree or disagree about those, um, about those dreams. So, um, it's first of all, with in enormous pleasure, I turn to um, Václav Havel to um, tell us which of your dreams came true and which didn't. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> if I may, one, one remark on beginning. It isn't my first visit in this economic, London Economic School. It is my second visit. The first one was 40 years ago. It was time when I had a passport. And it was during Prague Spring. And, um, and uh, it was the discussion with students was my first discussion with students abroad. Uh, I had big courage in that time, and I spoke here English. But now I'm older, more experienced, <laughs> and, and I would prefer to speak Czech, if you agree. But perhaps I can combine it. Já myslím, že ty základní ideály toho roku 89. 
se naplňují. Nelze říct, že byly zrazeny nebo opuštěny v žádné z našich zemí. Um, good evening. Um, I will be interpreting for those parts that um, follow in Czech. Um, Mr. Avel said that um, he cannot say that um, any of the idols would not be fulfilled. Jedna věc je ovšem ty formální znaky demokracie. Ty poměrně rychle u nás bylo možno, bylo možno vidět. Svobodné volby, pluralitní systém více stran, svoboda tisku, exekutiva, odpovědná parlamentu. To všechno se stalo poměrně brzy, jenomže to není všechno. Um, one thing is the um, first signs of democracy, and uh, they were seen in Czech Republic relatively soon. Um, I'm speaking about the signs as uh, free elections, uh, parliament, the um, executive, um, and so on, but this is, um, that's not everything. Důležitá je ta vlastní politická kultura, jejímž tyto instituty demokracie jsou výrazem. A ta se ukazuje, že podobně jako několik jiných věcí se konstruuje dlouhá léta a je k tomu třeba nástupu nových generací. Ukázalo se, že ta cesta je nepoměrně od té formální demokracie k té skutečné je nepoměrně složitější namáhavější, dlouhá. Ona ta cesta nikdy nedosáhne svého cíle, ale, ale aspoň by měla jakýmsi směrem jít. A ona tím směrem jde, ale strašně pomalu. So the more important thing than the, uh, the, the first sign of democracy is um, the uh, way um, how um, this, uh, this, the first signs um, are um, connected to the democracy and um, how the political culture is coming to Czech Republic and the path to the real political culture is um, rather long and uh, it's not easy and it, this part needs uh, more time, it needs more, um, it even needs more generations uh, in order to uh, be established. Thank you very much indeed um, about stuff. Now, um, Jan Czarnogorski, who I seems only quite recently that we were, I was watching your trial on the November the 11th, 1989, and worrying that you were never going to be able to negotiate with your persecutors who were so busy sending you to jail. But which of, you, which, of your, which of your dreams have come true and which not? I could say that all, all practically all my dreams came true. First, I <laughs> went I, uh, out of the jail, and second, uh, you know, the dreaming in an apartment is always uh, much easier than uh, making reality. Uh, being active in the reality, is especially in the social democratic reality uh, where all the fightings uh, take place. And of course, the uh, coming to fulfilling our dreams was much more difficult than we have dreamed about, but, but the, the substantial dreams came true. We are free society. We have market economy. We are member of European integration. Uh, yes, and uh, practically, if, if not to UK, I could, I could travel in Europe even without identity card. So, <laughs> Uh, in this sense, the dreams of uh, the year uh, 89 have come true. Very good. Marcus Merkel, your I would say, repeating what was said, um, that freedom and democracy, that was the main goal in that time for us, and it became true in a shorter time than we thought. Um, so I can agree 
that this was the main point. But I can say that more than I dreamed became true. Um, we didn't think in that time, in the beginning, that unification of Germany would really be possible. It was clear that the two democratic German states, that's nonsense. But in which way it can be reached, it was not clear in the beginning of 89. It was a question of acceptance uh, of the allies of the Second World War. It was a question of uh, our neighborhood. And we were clear we must not destabilize Europe. And so this both to bring together was a crucial point, And it became true earlier than I thought that it could be. One point I fought for in 1990 um, didn't uh, become true, and this is a question of disarmament. Uh, we, in the 80s, fought for a more disarmed and more secure world. And I think we, uh, after unification, after uh, starting that process of uniting Europe, which we can be really happy that uh, we were successful in that. And uh, we can be happy that the Lisbon Treaty hopefully uh, will be uh, in reality next days. Um, enlargement and that treaty both together is a marvelous uh, success. But the question of disarmament we neglected during the last 20 years, and I think especially the question of proliferation, the question of nuclear weapons, is a crucial point we neglected during the last two decades, and it has to be done in the future. Good. Can I ask you to pass the microphone back to Mr. Havel, because uh, um, we have very small ones, which will work fine. Mr. Yasensky, what's, 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 what's your quick take on 20 yes. years on? Well, okay. I'm also very happy to be here, particularly because as a historian, I did some research here, and I often use this library and also to eat here, but uh, uh, I think it should not be myself here, but rather my prime minister, uh, the late Josef Antal. I just want to show a recent uh, book, actually edited by myself, uh, collecting his, <laughs> well, I'm not, uh, no, it's okay. it's a good, good promotion is always okay. important. Okay, yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is not for sale, unfortunately, so it was public. <laughs> okay. But uh, I will leave a copy with the school, and actually I think it is a good record, not only of what Hungary did, uh, and, but rather, rather on foreign policy as well. But uh, uh, what, what was, well, I all agree uh, I, with, with my, the previous speakers, so they are all dreams which we all shared during communism. But uh, I was, I just turned 15 during the 1956 <laughs> Hungarian Revolution. I was involved in many ways, I uh, didn't have a weapon, but uh, after it was suppressed by the Soviet second intervention, uh, I did not uh, believe that I will see the end of communism and, and Soviet rule over Hungary. So this is the great uh, achievement, not myself, but for, I think for the whole world, that this bipolar world has come to an end and that uh, so many people are no longer ruled by a terrible dictatorship and by an irrational uh, economic system. Uh, and of course that Hungary is a member of NATO. Uh, as a young child, uh, I well, I already came to the conclusion, partly influenced by my father, we listened carefully to the foreign radios, especially the BBC, and uh, when the Hungarian media in the 50s uh, told how terrible, how bad, how aggressive NATO was, I, as a child, I saw that, I know that nothing is true, what the Hungarian radio is telling, so, NATO must be a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> and the fact that uh, I worked for it, and actually I was in Washington as ambassador when we became members, so that was really a crown achievement. And uh, of course, not all the dreams uh, have come true. Uh, it could be also a quite long list, I'm, for it, I'm sorry to say. But uh, when I became foreign minister in 1990, and one of my, well, after a few days, I attended a foreign ministerial meeting in. Copenhagen, the CSE uh, conference on the human dimension. And to my great surprise, practically all the speakers uh, 
uh, among others, said that, well, one of the great challenges, the task for the new Europe will be a more fair treatment for the national minorities. So those historic groups uh, who were separated from uh, their mother country by borders drawn after the First World War or after the Second. And uh, I was really perhaps very naive to think that all these democratic leaders uh, uh, who are uh, really committed uh, to fair treatment and all the new governments uh, will go out of their way to satisfy not only political differences and uh, political opposition, and to, but also minorities. And, well, we have made some progress, I admit, but very far from uh, what these very people who are members of the minorities uh, are keen to, to achieve. Thanks very much indeed. And Jan Krzysztof Bilewski, what's your, what's your well, upsum? I'm in a very com comfortable uh, situation because basic liberties have been uh, resolved by the pre pre speakers. And uh, so market, uh, democracy, United Germany, everything. So I can turn to my personal note uh, and tone. And I, I think that the more I think about the past, the more I would like to emphasize the, the most important factor. Maybe if, because I'm a sportsman by, by, by nature, I was born sportsman. So I think that the most important what we managed to achieve in the 90s and in that last decade, in Poland, in a country which was bankrupt and when we lost the martial law you just mentioned a few seconds ago, when after the martial law, a lot of people, colleagues of mine who, like us, were either in the internee or uh, in a regular prison, unfortunately 70% of them decided to leave the country because they thought that the, the fight is, is over, it, this is the end, there is no chance for the future. And, and we tried in a hopeless way to, to stay in the country, in my personal view, mostly in order not to give up. In, in not to give up and to, to fight for the, for the, for the pride. For, and the fact that we have managed to reestablish national pride in Poland and the Poles who were rather in different position 20 years ago. And today, the same people are so confident that according to EU survey, we are the most satisfied with the situation even though there is a global crisis and recession. And the country is, is doing still in, in, in green numbers, as, as we say in, in business, that the country is performing. And this morning I'm, I met the group of young colleagues reading at the LSE, and, and it was so impressive, but they were also so confident of being uh, Poles, you know, being, okay, Europeans, fine, but also being a confident Pole, and it's such a satisfaction, such a pride that you can build on that pride and, and really reach for impossible. And the second, very short, uh, is that as a sportsman, you always try to achieve something special. And the only thing which I achieved, and it was on purpose, and it was special and uh, unique in the world, was that we, we, we tried to be as careful as possible in order to recognize the independence of Ukraine as the first country in the world. And, uh, and due to the fact that also we work over the weekends, it was easier for us because Mulroney, the Prime Minister of Canada those days, he went for the weekend and, and missed, the, missed the point, even though the, the Ukrainian diaspora in, in, Canada is, in Canada is particularly important. So we were by far the first country recognizing independence of Ukraine. So you can say that we not only thought about ourselves or Central Europe, but we also tried to move that uh, uh, change further to the east. And I think it was important and still it is important. Well, let's move the conversation a little bit further east, because I'm, I'm very struck by if we put the clock back 20 years, we'd be feeling absolutely thrilled about what was, um, had happened in Central Europe. We'd also be feeling tremendously excited about what was happening in the Soviet Union then. And although there's been some very bright spots, such as the um, Baltic States' return 
to Europe. There's been other things which have been really very disappointing. I remember after the Velvet Revolution um, in Czechoslovakia, Jan Urban getting on the phone to tell Sakharov all about it. Sakharov was still alive then. And if you see what's been happening in Russia um, over the last 20 years, I think it's hard to say that our dreams have come true. Maybe Mr. Putin's dreams have come true, but I'm not sure um, that um, many of us would, would share that. So I'd, I'd like to ask um, Václav Havel for his, his thoughts on, the, on, on the, the Europe further east and how you feel um, your, w w which of your dreams have come true there and w which not, and, and what, are you wor what are you worried about? Především, jo, anglicky jsem chtěl mluvit, ano. I think it's necessary to tell here one thing. The collapse of communism was possible in a moment when our countries, countries cooperated. When we tried to change the system, and we are isolated, it always was, was finished, finished. and in, in, in 89 there were a lot of different things which together made, made the good conditions for the changes. The international situation was relatively good. Uh, Gorbachev's perestroika was also important because because he uh, it would be funny if he uh, speaks about perestroika and and sent army somewhere. It's it was impossible, and um, important was also what happened in Poland before, 10 years before it, establishing of Solidarność and this, this round tables which were sooner than our changes, etc., etc. I think it's, it's important to mention it. Generally, I think that, that there exists one Europe which is very pluralistic, a lot of very different nations, states, minorities, everything. But what is important is that mm, Europe was united many times in history, but always uh, stronger uh, uh, dictated the order to um, uh, them who are not such strong. It is the first case now in the European Union when um, the integration is team of conferences, the discussions, etc. And it isn't, it isn't a team of wars. I think it's important and uh, I think that uh, I prefer Czech. Já myslím, že, já myslím, že je třeba žádat od západu pochopení a trpělivost s našimi zeměmi. Mnohonásobně se to vyplatí. I think it's very important to be um, asking for understanding from the Western countries and it will be paid back uh, many times. Ten, ten vývoj neměl alternativu. Um, the development has no other alternative than that. Well, and yeah, um, Jan Czarnogorski, you're a regular visitor to the Valdai Club, where um, Mr. Putin and Mr. Medvedev hold court among um, some Western visitors. What, 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 what's your feeling about um, what's been happening in Russia over the years? Uh, first, Slovakia is maybe an exception among these countries. Because we we have uh, we do not feel any historical burden toward neither Russia nor Germany nor anybody. Hungary, maybe. A little bit hungry, <laughs> but <it's>, uh, <laughs> uh, you, you laughed correctly because the tension between Slovakia and Hungary is ridiculous and nothing more. In, yes, in, in uh, continental vision, 
Uh, and that, that's why uh, Slovakia is, uh, has, is streaming good relations both to Russia and, and <laughs> US and UK and, <laughs> and uh, each country else. And uh, maybe Slovakia in this sense a little bit took over the role of uh, Austria uh, in the time of communism when Austria was um, part of Western Europe, but, uh, uh, but uh, um, uh, was interested in, in good relations toward the uh, Soviet Union. The same a little bit maybe is doing Slovakia now. And in this sense, we have, we have uh, taken uh, the politics of former Czechoslovakian uh, foreign minister Eduard Beneš who played on both sides, both to the west and uh, to the east. And even when he was uh, sitting in London during the war, but uh, made, uh, made treaties with, Soviet, with Stalin, with Soviet Union. So I think that, that it is not in interest of Europe that uh, Europe would be divided maybe in some, an some another form and uh, thousand kilometers uh, east fr from uh, the former uh, division line and uh, that uh, yes the Russia U European Union and uh, United States should form a block of Christian civilization that could oppose to to the challenges of the other parts of the world Right, okay. Marcus, do you agree with that? I think when I remember the time in 1990, we thought, and I myself thought, that this is not only the starting point for democracy, but it will be completed in Soviet Union too, um, and later in Russia. And then we had, um, that's one point. The second point was uh, in the negotiations, two plus four, uh, preparing the German unification, it was important that Russia, or Soviet Union in that time, has to accept the sovereignty, including the NATO membership of the United Germany, but also to be aware that, and this was my point too, and I said it to Shabbat Nazi when we met first in April 90, that we are interested that Soviet Union is linked with Europe because it is clear this is um, a part of security for the future. Uh, and it would be a problem in that time if the Soviet Union could understand themselves that the treaty would be a vasai for the Soviet Union. And that has had to be prevented. And I think this was the case, and we succeeded with that. But the problem is that Soviet Union started, but Russia failed to continue that way towards democracy. And when sometimes in Germany it was said uh, from a former chancellor that um, Russia has difficulties in that difficult, large situation going forward towards democracy, I would say that is the wrong picture, in my view. Uh, it has lost the way of going towards democracy. And this is our difficulty today. How to deal with Russia? Because it's clear security in Europe, security global, is needed together with Russia. We need that cooperation on the one hand. But on the other hand, it is needed to make them clear that we are interested in democratic development of Russia. And for instance, that their neighbors has to be secure and sovereign too, including <coughs> Georgia, including Ukraine, uh, that they have the right to decide to go their own way, as we did as Germans in 1990. And both has to be clear, and I think that it's a challenge for us as European Union that we have a common Russia. This is the challenge. 
I hope very much that there are some Russians um, in the audience and Ukrainians and Georgians too. And when we get to questions, I hope you'll get a chance to tell us how um, you see it and follow up on that issue. But, um, Gabriel Yersensky, do you, do you feel we've missed a trick with Russia? Do you think we should be engaging on the question of the new security architecture and completing the task of 1989 that way? Or? Uh, well, uh, in the early 90s, uh, I was uh, very pleasantly, I wouldn't say surprised, but I was very pleased to see uh, really uh, Europe uh, or even beyond Europe working, uh, moving towards uh, an overall security. The new world order uh, announced by President Bush the Elder uh, sounds to be a, or seem to be a quite a real uh, possibility. The United Nations, the very exalted principles of that organization, apparently came through or were approaching. Uh, the Gulf War showed it. And Russia, the new Russia, cooperated in, in all that. Uh, so we Hungarians, despite 56 or bis, despite uh, the 1849, uh, Russian intervention. Uh, we did not feel, and I personally never felt really something very bad or hostile attitude towards Russia. Actually, my life was saved because a Russian soldier in 56 could have shot me, but uh, he did not. So I have a personal reason to. But also, uh, with all the shortcomings uh, of Yeltsin, and especially in his later years, uh, I think uh, he and his uh, foreign minister, Koziriev, were very forthcoming and very genuinely promising at trying to move towards democracy. It was the economic fear and the sphere and, and the, the oligarchs which I think uh, led to this, uh, his demise. But, uh, uh, well, the very term uh, near abroad is, is worrying, not only for the Baltic states, even for uh, Hungary, which is not, uh, board, not bordering Russia now, but, well, if Ukraine moves in a different direction, it will be again almost a border. And uh, also the U.S. Russian policy, not simply towards the neighbors, but uh, well, the Russian uh, attitude to Stalinism, for example, as a, being a historian. Well, all these efforts to whitewash Stalin is really worrying. It is not simply inaccurate historically, but it is a sign of a very bad tendency. And well, uh, it is also threatening uh, well security in a in a in a sense, uh, because, uh, well, Stalin was certainly an aggressor and uh, bent on expansionism. I don't think that uh, but expansionism in the traditional imperialistic sense is a danger now. But economic expansionism is, is certainly there, and especially using energy, uh, as you like, uh, if you say, a, a blackmailing uh, device. And, uh, well, I think uh, we should not isolate Russia. I never thought it. But... Uh, a common uh, position, particularly in energy, uh, is the only way, I think, uh, to prevent bad tendencies which have, has not pre have not prevailed in Russia yet. But if we want uh, uh, a good future and a secure Europe, uh, uh, then I think uh, we should uh, certainly do not close, we should not close our eyes to some of the bad tendencies. And Jan Krzysztof Bielewski, you come from a country which has a border <coughs> with Russia, and where they've just been having the biggest military maneuvers since the end of the Cold War, um, which seemed to have a scenario that was perhaps not altogether comforting from a Polish point of view. Um, what's, what, what's, what's your feeling about this? Well, I think uh, in politics, but in an honest uh, life, <coughs> words, words have meaning. And my problem with Russian is that sometimes I have a view that we are going back to the old days when schizophrenia was a principle of behavior and the words didn't have any meaning. When, because in order to settle uh, accounts with Russians, I have to use the same words in order to describe the same situation. When we speak about the uh, human rights, when we speak about uh, functioning uh, democracy, then I would not like to see the uh, independent uh, journalists being assassinated or uh, fighting for, for the right to, to, to publish uh, uh, freedom, to, freedom to, to speak. Uh, when we speak about trade, I have nothing against the trade, but then you should not use the trade as a kind of a weapon and almost officially declare that the gas has also strategic meaning and it's not only business. So if not the business, then what, what is behind that? 
when when we uh, believe in 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 independence uh, and in friendship, then we should not invade uh, any country, and then practically force partition of the country on the basis that uh, we have the, the power to decide. So, so this is the problem. That I think that they have to, to make a final decision which way they, they want to go. If they want to go for kind of an authoritarian system with a, a, a state bureaucracy and quasi-market, it's fine. But when they continuously not so defer, fine. It's not fine for them. Yeah, it's, it's not fine also for the, for the people, but at least it's, it's clear situation. But we, we, we should not accept that schizophrenic attitude on the basis that we don't want to isolate them and therefore we should have a special treatment and, and practically uh, double standards. And I had the same conversation many, many years ago with Gorbachev, who tried to explain to me that they, they, they have a problem with us. And it was beautiful because he was for half an hour speaking, what is the problem with Poles and said, about unfriendly attitude towards Russian soldiers, Russian people, uh, trade is in collapse, everything is shambles. And I, uh, after half an hour, I managed to jump on and said, OK, if you be so kind, I would like to say that I couldn't agree with more with you. And I would also like to be a friend of, of Russia. But uh, if you understand that uh, we are friends and you treat me as a friend, why do you keep 60,000 of soldiers on, on my soul without my permission? Uh, why do you use uh, uh, nuclear weapons uh, on the Polish soil? And, and why do you, for example, uh, in some kind of uh, uh, agreement with, with Germans, why do you uh, transfer your troops and some, some ammunition and also supplies to the Polish territory as it would be a co corridor, exterritorial corridor? Why don't you ask me for permission at least? Because we had such an incident at the border, and he was a bit surprised, and then admitted that this is a good point, and we should maybe discuss about withdrawal of the Soviet troops from Poland. So maybe we should speak in a more open way, and also in, from the Western perspective, avoid that kind of a schizophrenic attitude, and in order not to to offend them, and therefore we would accept something what would we never accept in a small country. Uh, so, Václav Havel, did you want to just add anything on the subject of Russia? I completely agree with Mr. Bielecki. I think that I think that um, what now exists in Russia is special, very sophisticated type of half-authoritarian regime. It is perhaps very danger, not only for us, but for people in Russia. And I think that what is necessary is to build partnership with Russia, but real partnership has to be based on two pillars, openness and equality. It means that it is impossible to behave to them like they are handicapped, somebody a little bit different than other partners all around the world, somebody with whom we cannot speak openly. We cannot speak about political scale such uh, such things because we need the oil and we need the gas, etc. It's completely wrong policy. Speak um, openly about everything with this risiko, and they accept it or not. But I think that a big mistake is um, to behave to them like. Uh, they would be ill or uh, some very special um, kind of people from Mars or, or what. Thank you very much. Um, it's, it's easy to, um, to get carried away in a tide of um, nostalgia and even sa self-satisfaction about all the wonderful things that have happened. But I, I was looking at some statistics from the EBRD in a, a book they did called Life in, Life in Transition, which was actually the statistics collected at the height of the 
economic boom, which has now, of course, um, ended. And it was quite striking how, although one can say from the point of view of the political elite this has been a tremendous success, that the people, perhaps a bit less enthusiastic, really quite small numbers of people saying that they, um, their life is a lot better than it was, that they feel that the political system is working for them and so on. So I wanted to, as our sort of final round before we go over to the um, questions from the audience, I want to ask um, all the people on the panel who've all held executive power one way or another as foreign ministers, prime ministers or as presidents, if they could do it again, knowing what they know now, what would they do differently? Perhaps to give Mr. Havel a chance just to reflect on that, I'll go the other way around. Um, Mr. Bielecki, if you could do it again, put the clock back with your knowledge of 2009, what would you do differently as Prime Minister, if anything? <laughs> it's difficult to do it. Well, I would ask the successor to, to follow to my instructions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. no, well, uh, even today at the EBRD, we had a quick uh, exchange of views on... Uh, success of financial sector in Eastern Europe. And I a little bit challenge the, the point uh, made by the chief economist who suggested that it, it's a fantastic, successful story. And it mitigated the effects of, of, of the financial crisis in, in the region. And, and I think it's too much, because it, it's not exactly the, the, the case. And the, the picture is not that rosy. And the impact was sometimes quite negative, and there was a lot of policy mistakes imposed uh, by the foreign banks um, on the countries and on the operations in, the, in those transition countries. And sometimes they actually acted and behaved in the way which was absolutely not acceptable in their own countries, by, not acceptable by the regulators, not acceptable by also, I think, simple business logic. So, for, example, for example, what? For example, what? what? Uh, in the most dangerous, the most dangerous, and this is what we tried to avoid from the very beginning because we had a very bad memory in Poland, was to avoid the currency crisis, uh, which means that if the foreign banks promoted foreign currency lend lending, therefore they were asking for the crisis. If on top of it, some of them <coughs> lent more than 100% of the value of the property, sometimes 130%, it's not business, but it's gambling. But additionally, as I said before, they overruled the, the regulations which were binding for them in the uh, home countries. Uh, but that's why maybe I was joking that I would ask my, my colleagues to obey my instructions because in Poland, in the beginning, in the early years, also including the assistance from the IFC, we came to the point, for example, that regarding privatization of financial sector, we would like to have a partial privatization of minority stake, and also we would pay a lot for uh, upgrade of uh, good uh, management uh, practices, uh, for technical assistance, expertise, and so on, and then slowly made the, the, the sector public uh, and, and to avoid the, for the more citizens to, to benefit uh, from that. And to, to give you a good example, the, the bank, and this last sentence, the bank, which was privatized uh, 10 years ago for 1 billion today, is of the market value 25 billion. So it's... it's it, it was a chance for, for the public to a little bit get more uh, if the privatization was done in a in, in couple of uh, stages and in the more respected way. Well, well two very powerful, yeah. powerful prescriptions there. Ignore uh, bad advice from outsiders and make sure your successes <laughs> do as they're told. Mr. Yes Yesensky, what, what would be your... What's your well, first of all, uh, I'm still happy that my responsibility was foreign affairs and not <laughs> economic affairs. Or, or, but apart from that, uh, I think that uh, on the one hand, uh, hung, well, not only Hungarians, in all over the former communist world, uh, there was general disappointment. Not immediately, but quite soon, because people well, were happy with, with freedom and uh, a life without informers, like in, in GDR and so on. But uh, basically, they expected a, sub, a substantial improvement in the standard of living. And uh, instead of that, uh, there was unemployment. Uh, and uh, 
well, uh, people had to work harder. Uh, and uh, of course, the, what we call sometimes a premature welfare state, the very bad services, but cheap services, whether in health service or in education, that was uh, gone. And uh, of course, people resented it. So uh, how, uh, well, it is the task of an, an economic historian uh, who could perhaps uh, tell what should have been done in a different uh, way. But uh, I maintain, and always maintain, that uh, much of our problems were due to the fact that communism was imposed on this region. So, uh, well, Austria did not have a um, substantially better, higher standard of living uh, in the interwar period than Hungary, or than Czechoslovakia. But uh, uh, after a few decades of communism, uh, the difference was enormous. So uh, it was really uh, this imposed system which was responsible uh, not only for the political crimes, for the terror, uh, for the political prisoners and so on, but also for the economic misery of the communist period and the post-communist period. Some people said that what is worse than communism, what comes after? <laughs> and that is a, a really, unfortunately, a, a quite a joke, or more than a joke. But uh, so on the one hand, uh, the public should have been better educated about uh, communism itself, because the young people, especially in Hungary, had an easier life, so communism was not at the worst uh, in Hungary. But, uh, and uh, well, after the Second World War, uh, well, Japan and, and uh, Germany and, of course, uh, all this, uh, the, well, Italy, were told, people were told uh, about the crimes. And uh, well, just to the point you asked, uh, what uh, I think today could uh, should have been done in a different way. Well, uh, to keep more jobs, well, I don't know how. Certainly, privatization, which uh, introduced uh, very sensible new policies, and m many people were, were laid off. But uh, to make to create such a large section of unemployed people who came to who become used to uh, a kind of uh, benefit, uh, unemployment benefit, without any work. So I think uh, that is corrupting people, and. Uh, that is something which should have been avoided, among many other things. Yes. Marcus Merkel, it'd be quite hard to look at the GDR territories now as that are part of the, of, of, the, of the new United Germany and say this was the Blühende Landschaft that we were um, talking about in 1990. If you look back on your time as a um, very senior official in the, in, 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 in the GDR, is there anything you'd have done differently? What I have done different it's not so much, I would say. But uh, what has been done by governments, which I do didn't take part, or including that coalition, I belong to the uh, coalition in the social democratic government, uh, I think that for that region, it had uh, to be a better attention as a national policy towards that region, because if you see, or oh, if I had experienced uh, last weeks to lose my seat in the parliament because that constituency was won by the post-communist left party, uh, and this is the case in the whole east of the state Brandenburg, then it gives uh, food for thinking um, about the situation uh, and the development of democracy. Uh, and if I see in that constituency, which has an unemployment rate of almost 20% today, 20 years after, then I think it gives, uh, it, it, it's, it shows you um, that there is a challenge. And I don't see enough really attention of the federal government uh, to deal with that development. There is no strategy uh, really to deal with. But I would like to raise uh, some points I see really a challenge, uh, not only because my own deficit in the past, but uh, I think that the question of a common foreign policy in the future of Europe in the global situation is a crucial point, um, which is necessary. And the linkage between EU and NATO is a very important point, and we have to convince the Turk the Turks really to stop with their blocking. And we have together developed more initiatives in that field. That's one point. The second point is I think that 
um, the promotion of democracy is a crucial point, and we are not good as European Union uh, in that field. Uh, we talked about Russia and uh, to deal with authoritarian uh, states or almost authoritarian states, and I think dialogue is necessary with them. And cooperation with such a big state, an important state in the global world, is necessary. But at the same time, it has to be very frank and open, as it was said. And we have, in the same time, to help and assist civil society and democratic opposition with, with good means and independent means. And we are doing it not enough, in my view, as the European Union, because democracy can only develop from domestic powers. But we have to support them. We can't export democracy. But we can help that power, that groups in society to develop, uh, to educate, uh, and so on. In this field, can be done much more. Thanks very much. Jan Czernogorski, what do you regret from your time as Prime Minister of the Slovak <laughs> Republic? For all politicians, it's almost impossible to regret something what they have done in the past. <laughs> Sadly. <laughs> yes, but when you are asking, uh, and not, not, uh, not only because you are asking, uh, I think that uh, we in the ex-communist countries, we should have been uh, equally eager not only to take over the, the system of economy, methods of management, etc., but as well uh, means, instruments of social protection of people who are victims of these uh, changes of uh, eco social and economic system. Uh, I see it especially now as I am working as a lawyer, how people are being robbed of their apartments, houses, etc., uh, that they have uh, subscribed as, as guarantees for loans, much much lower loans than the the value of, of the apartments, etc., et and the state has <laughs> almost nothing uh, to protect them, much less than uh, for similar cases as Austria or, or Germany, uh, just uh, countries where, where I uh, know the situation. Uh, and uh, we, are, we are even learning these pro protection methods very, very slowly. Uh, I, I think that, that creating the conditions for rising the oligarchs is almost as bad as, as imprisonment of dissidents. Right. Um, thanks so much. Last word to you, uh, Václav, before we go to the uh, before we go to the discussion. I think I made a lot of a lot of mistakes, surely. Uh, but if I have to name some of them, I think that uh, my mistake was that I much believe to economists. Mm. And uh, <laughs> I thought I thought they are experts, they are scientists, they surely know what they do. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> and after, and I supported them also in moments when I mm, uh, don't agree much with them. And I think it it was it was mistake the economic reform would be complicated anyway and they i think didn't make it easier but more complicated and uh, uh, of course it perhaps would be possible more accent the moral dimension of so social life and of, of every, everything, the moral road or moral code um, is uh, background of lawyer uh, code or, or um, uh, uh, government of law. Or rule how of is law. the rule of law? Uh, rule, of law. Uh, rule of law. Yes, and um, 
it could be very well prepared or all, all um, uh, the whole law system could be completely prepared but without some moral imperatives which are inside society it doesn't work because always there are some um, some ways how to uh, how to live with this law and uh, i i think that perhaps they wrote about me that i am moralist I don't think I was enough of a moralist. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, well, now it's over to you, Isaac. Can we have the microphone in the middle of the um, balcony there? There's a gentleman with his hand up. Can get the microphone to him, please? And then there's a lady at the back there with long hair. Yes, yes, that's right, you. Yes, don't look so surprised. It's going to be okay. Um, we have the microphone, the downstairs microphone, going to, going to you. It's come round. Sir, have you got the microphone up there? Yes, go ahead. No, you haven't got it yet. You're going to get it in a moment. It's the lady there. That's right. Go ahead, sir. Yeah. Yes, hello. Uh, I am Eduardo uh, Baudet from, from the LSE, first year. Um, you have talked about openness, clarity, democracy, and effectively you all contributed to ending the Iron Curtain. Being from Venezuela, I kind of see a red curtain, if you will, being drawn upon by Chavez, Correa, etc. And I have seen artists being in prison, uh, students being shot at. I have been shot at and thrown uh, gas bombs again. So how can, how can me, being an oligarch, because it's true, um, fight against Chavez and all of that when the majority, um, being poor and uneducated, uh, still support Chavez, and Chavez still says that because he wins the elections democratically, right. he, he has a right to remain in power. Thanks very much. And then the um, lady down there. Go ahead, ma'am. Yes. Good evening. Uh, my name is Petra Šerpetková. I'm an LSC alumni. And, uh, thanks. Can you speak into the microphone, please? Oh, yeah. Sure. Uh, I would like to thank everybody for their uh, comments. It was uh, uh, very insightful. Uh, my question is for uh, Mr. Václav Havel. I was wondering if you could kindly comment on the current Czech president's attempts to uh, exclude the Czech Republic from the European community. I may, I may rule that one out as being too much like a press conference, but we'll, okay. see, whether, we'll, <laughs> we'll see whether Mr. Havel wants to answer it. I'm going to take um, one more question from up there, the um, per very back who's got Good the... Good evening, and, and then can we have the microphone down here in the middle of the front row, please? Yes, go ahead. Yeah. Good evening, and thank you very much for this conference. Well, actually, I'm a student here at LSE. I'm Romanian, so we're more or less in the same boat. So I would like to know how vital was the role of international organizations such as the World Bank, International Monetary Fund, in the reconstruction of the countries of the ex-Soviet bloc, and in which way has the rules of a new economic game, like the, regula the regulation of the markets, the introduction of a form of neoliberalism, influenced the actual state of economy and its development? Thank you. Very good, and uh, go ahead, sir, and then we'll come to the panel for... Thank you very much, Ed. Uh, I think I speak for everyone. I feel very honoured to be uh, in the presence of five such great individuals. Um, my very specific question is, would 1989 have happened when it did without the intervention of Pope John Paul II? Right, excellent. Well, the, um, I think we'll take... No, don't feel... that I, I don't want every panellist to answer every question, so if you just take the one that is most interesting... Um, for you and then answer it. Um, but, um, Mr. Bielecki, perhaps you want to do the, the Polish Pope? <laughs> or, do you want to do, or do you want to do the IMF and the World Bank? Or both? Yeah, you know, I like to talk. So. <laughs> uh, yeah. That's why maybe the, the most important is the question regarding Chavez, if I Go ahead. really properly understood the, the point, because this is something what is fundamentally put regarding the the chance uh, to promote or to help or to assist to develop liberties uh, all over the world. And my view on that point is very simple. We should support, everybody should support. There's a lot of international organizations to provide support, but we cannot replace anybody. So at the end, it has to be up to the people 
to, to, to raise and, and to stand against any dictator, whether it's Chavez or whoever, or, or Stalin, or at, the, at present you have a, a lot of them, and nobody from outside could, could change the situation but, but, but the people. Very good. Uh, Mr. Yesensky, any? Well, perhaps I will answer, try to answer the question about the Pope, or yes, in my more you. general word, uh, who is responsible for the changes? Of course, success has many fathers, and uh, many Americans think that it was Ronald Reagan and his Star Wars project, which really brought <laughs> the Soviet Union down. Now, uh, not to so, so much the Russians who have not such a high opinion on Gorbachev, but West Europeans, I think, then thought, and today too, that, well, it was this enlightened Soviet leader who, instead of suppressing, uh, uh, well, like they did in 56, in 68, and in Poland so often, uh, he was uh, allowing and he let the communist uh, satellites go. And certainly there is a lot of truth in it. I also tend to think that uh, the moral stand by the Pope, and, and especially such words that don't be afraid, and uh, of course uh, his tours of Poland, his pilgrimages in Poland, which uh, moved the Polish people uh, so much, and certainly inspired everybody in the communist bloc. And uh, finally, it was uh, the, the very people who brought uh, these things down, well, the communist systems down. The Polish people, the Hungarian people, if these countries uh, had not moved, had not demanded changes, now we know, actually, that the Western leaders did not want communism to end. It is being revealed now from documentary evidence that uh, they thought that, well, a milder form of communism is all right, the division of Europe should not be so marked, the Iron Curtain is nice to go, but uh, they accepted the communists, they got used to them. Uh, so without uh, the actual challenge uh, by the opposition parties emerging first in Poland and in Hungary and then in other countries, and of course all these great spectacular events like the Velvet Revolution, the Romanian Revolution against Ceausescu, so uh, we would still live in communism and we certainly would not be here, these persons, if uh, the people had not taken action. Yes. Mm. Um, if there are any Russians in the audience, get your hands up, because I am keen to hear a voice from, fur from, fur from further east, if there's anyone here. But uh, Mark, you go ahead. I think the result of 1989 and 90 was really, really the success of the people. Uh, and often it is said, uh, especially in America, we won the Cold War, uh, or the West won the Cold War. I don't think so. Uh, I think it was not the victory of the West against the East. It was a victory of freedom and democracy in the East, because in these countries, uh, many people stand for that and fought for that, and not only for some time, but also uh, many, for many years, or their whole life. And many things came together to bring it to an excess. And processes who are contradicted. Gorbachev didn't want to finish the communism. He yes. wanted to save it. Yes. And we can be happy that he had that error, that it could be possible. Um, and so he tried to save it. And he was aware that it has to be changed. But change communism in such crucial points means to destroy it. But he didn't understand it. We can be happy about that. Um, if, if you see East Germany, um, we only got the mass, uh, such many people to the streets, not as a little opposition alone, but because uh, of Hungary, for instance, the opening the border. We had tensions in, in these 80s between opposition and people who only wanted to go. We tried to convince them to stay and to, to fight uh, because we lost that critical substance in the society by going. But both together, contradictory, uh, helped us and brought that revolution. And so I think this has to be understood. Ms. Chavez, I would like to say, uh, it, as mentioned, it has to be done by the people themselves. But I don't think that's why it has to be added it's our responsibility too. It's responsibility too. Three points, in my view, in every case with authoritarian systems or rulers are important. Dialogue, 
but very clear own positions. Not speaking in only friendly way, as only as brothers. It has to be clear the difference between Democrats and dictators. Although sometimes they have to cooperate in some fields, uh, but the difference has to be clear. The second point is that we need what I mentioned, really to assist that people in prisons, that people um, with other instruments, with foundations, with other people for civil society and uh, Democrats in these countries and political prisoners, we have to be, give public and international support for that. That's a crucial point, and it's not <coughs> contradiction to cooperation with Russia or others, mm. but this both has to be really crucial, and um, economic cooperation <coughs> must not prevent to have that open positions. I think this is a crucial point, which until now, not every time that lessons is learned. And I'd, I'd just like to ask, uh, to stay on the subject of the West for a moment, because we've talked a lot about Russia and the East, and so on, I'd like to ask both Jan Czarnogorski and Václav Havel, um, how they see the role of the West in 1989. It was obviously the polar opposite of communism, and a lot of people, as um, Mr. Yesensky said, they knew that everything that the um, communist propaganda said was wrong, so therefore everything in the West must be good. But what was, looking back now, do you think there was an, over an overemphasis on the role of the West, because that's where the support for the distant movement was coming from? Was the West perhaps not really the right template to look at for the change? Uh, I would say two points. Uh, first, that West was, was uh, uh, strong on, on opposing communism in, in Europe. Uh, I can say that uh, when, in, uh, when in the West sh should have been uh, this uh, American missiles uh, stationed, it was in uh, when eighty. Uh, uh, yes, uh, and the the our press in Czechoslovakia, in all communist countries, Good. reported about protesters in the West, say especially in UK, against against these missiles. We, I, I was considering these protesters as traitors, as yes, uh, uh, weak people who who were able to capitulate uh, before uh, communism. So uh, the, the, the position, the strong position of the West was one con condition, and the, in the East, in the East, uh, yes, the West was uh, in the same time serving as a model, practically for, for us. I am living in Bratislava, the Austrian border is some two kilometers from the center of the city. So <coughs> everything, the cars, the, the people who, uh, how they were dressed, uh, Austrians, they, they, um, they were uh, coming to Bratislava, TV programs, everything we consider as better than uh, in our countries. So the West uh, was in the same time as a model for us. And uh, communism was an artificial social system. And as long as uh, 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 communism governed in any country, as clearer is it was that it is artificial social system for uh, more and more people. <laughs> I would say that uh, British Museum in London cannot be proud that in its library the theory of this system has been <laughs> Uh, developed by Charles Marx. Uh, so, Ca uh, care careful, because this place was founded by socialists. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. okay. Uh, so, this, this uh, yes, and then uh, the opposition against communism in in uh, co uh, co communist countries, and yes, I can say that our generation was almost happy that. We did not, uh, uh, did not uh, experience the harshest methods of communism against opposition because in in fifties in Czechoslovakia were almost three hundred people executed 
after some uh, judicial uh, uh, trials uh, for, for being opponents of communism. So later, the, even the methods of uh, communism were weaker because communism as system was weaker vis-a-vis -vis the West. Václav Havel, you, you don't have to answer the question about the other Václav if you don't want to, but we'd, I'd be very interested to know your thoughts about the West. <laughs> I, I think that you know, the international solidarity is very important, is more, and it is more important than people in democratic conditions could imagine. I would be not five, but 15 years in a prison if without this, this solidarity. And I think it's necessary to follow the the situation all around the world and support all people who are some, somehow uh, uh, pressed and uh, to speak about them, to use all opportunities to speak about them, to speak about them also in conversations with uh, their leaders. By the way, Many years ago, I was in plenary session of United Nations in New York, and I was sitting with Mr. Chavez. He was in front of me, and he told me that I am, I am his teacher. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, I think I think I am very bad te teacher. <laughs> I think that this support was extremely important, but I think that now when we uh, East European countries are 20 years free, we have more and more the similar or same same problems like whole world and our world isn't in good condition there are a lot of problems ecological and with population with immigration etc etc and i think it is our common problem and it is it isn't now important who is from east who is from west or south or or north these problems i think is is extremely extremely big and extremely important thank you very much um now we've got a final round of uh, questions i'd like the microphone to the gentleman at the back in the blue shirt he's been very patient and there was a gentleman up there who's holding a uh, his ticket in his hand. If you could have the keep it up so they can see where to take the microphone to. Go ahead, sir. Yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, well, first of all, uh, Pano Kroko from Environmental Parliament. And uh, I have two questions in the form of one. And that is uh, seeing Europe with the knowledge that you've gained for so many years as part of another failed Commonwealth that was very centralized. Do you believe now that the European model of a federal community is a successful one? And if so, do you believe that we should have as the first president of Europe a person who is not uh, branded as the usual suspect politician, but somebody who can be above that, perhaps like Václav Havel? Right. So, uh, which country are you from, sir? I didn't catch I, I live in England. Yes. But right, okay. you, so I, I thought you said you were a member of parliament. I didn't quite catch Environmental it. parliament. Oh, right, OK, fine. That's a different parliament. Very good. Um, sir, go Thank ahead you. up there. Yes. We have the microphone down here. So. Yes, uh, good evening. Uh, first and foremost, for most, I want to thank the panelists for their kind uh, remarks. I noticed that all the panelists here are from satellite, satellite states of, of the former Soviet Union. My question is, in what way did the detachment from the central government, or as Professor Desinsky uh, pointed out, the feeling of having an ideology imposed on you shaped your aversion or your resistance to the uh, communist ideal? In other words, why did the satellite states never drink the Kool-Aid and never adopted wholesale the communist ideology. Very good. Um, so go ahead. Um, 
I understand that democracy means a wide political scale of um, parties and opinions. Um, I just wonder if the panelists can comment on the, or could they, could they, would have they anticipated 20 years ago the rise of the right in your, an extreme right in your respective countries, and what views do you have on it now? Very good. And um, can we have the microphone to the gentleman at the very back there who's had his um, hand up? I'm going to take a whole bunch of questions, and then, with your permission, I'm going to overrun about five minutes. We did start late. Yes, go ahead. Yes, that's right. Yes. Thank Where's you. Where's the downstairs microphone? My name is uh, Tobias Stapf. I'm from uh, Eastern Germany. And my question was thinking of um, the things that, so to say, went wrong over the last 20 years. I would want to ask, uh, what are your dreams for the next 20 years? Dreams for the next 20 years. That's a very good um, subject. Can you have the microphone to the middle there with the gentleman in the suit and the pink tie, please? Sorry, not exactly pink, but sort of pinkish. I'm Yeri Priban from Cardiff University, formerly Charles University, Prague. And first of all, I would like to thank all panelists for tonight and uh, especially for what they did 20 years ago. It was a good job and without you, <laughs> it would be much harder. Uh, however, I would like to uh, turn the question of the evening uh, upside down and ask you, uh, what is your biggest nightmare for the future of Central Eastern Europe? Is it further rise of ethno-nationalism, political corruption, marginalization, parochialism, or, uh, yeah. Right, well, there's about 30 more hands up, and I just think you're going to have to save your fire for the reception afterwards. And if you're very lucky, you may be a, a chance to pose a question to your favorite panelists uh, there. So we've got a, a great list of questions. What's your dream? What's your nightmare? Um, and lots of other ones in between. So I'm going to go from left to right across the panel and ask people to keep their remarks to just two or three minutes, please. Preferably two. Mr. Bielecki. It's me. Yes. Ah. Yeah. Mm. So we have plenty of questions. And yeah. Also your from, one. Yeah, from the previous round. So. Mm. On the nightmare, because that question comes close to the previous question regarding the view for the next 20 Yes. Uh, over the last uh, couple of weeks, I tried to discuss this issue uh, with some famous professors, uh, members of academia. Uh, it, and it was based on the research they did of the Polish uh, um, people on a very big sample. And, and, the, and my question was, what is exactly the, the greatest, the most important obstacles uh, or obstacle in the future development of the country. And what they said was very, very clear, and they said that there's a hard evidence on that. that um, we will, we will, for the next uh, five, maybe even 10 years, uh, benefit from enormous success and sustainable development as the country. So the feel good factor will improve and so on. And it's mostly built on good investment level, inflow of investment, EU integration, and we are the, the biggest recipient country, net recipient country, and also on the human capital. As we, over those two decades, we increase by three times uh, the number of graduates and, and, and so on. What is the, the, the despite, uh, let's say, global situation, which is a separate issue, internal, in-house obstacle, they said that it's a, a lack of uh, social capital, is how they call it. It's a lack of co uh, confidence uh, amongst uh, Poles. Uh, and, and if we we'll compare the trust of Norwegians, for example, the 75% of Norwegians trust each other, in Poland, it's only 15%, 1-5%. So, so maybe, and without that ability of a confidence, reaching of consensus and, and good cooperation, it's very difficult to move to the more innovative and more demanding world of, of the next uh, uh, decade when we will come out uh, from the crisis with a huge, in my opinion, institutional change 
and, and that in that process, in order to be competitive and, and build the, the, the strong nation, you need more that, that social ca capital to, 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 to be developed. Yes, that's most, thank you. So financial capital, human capital, social capital. That's uh, uh, possibly a, a, new, yeah. a, a, new, a new master's at LSE in the study of those. Uh, yeah. um, Mr. Yesen Yesenski. Yes, well, I think uh, we were all formed by communism and we were all opposed to communism and that's why we continue to believe uh, in democracy and would like to see really a democratic Russia, even a democratic China, which is uh, very far... Uh, uh, a chance, uh, but uh, well, anything which which uh, goes in the wrong direction, in the opposite direction, is certainly a, a nightmare, a worry. Certainly, I do not believe that uh, uh, communism will come back uh, to these countries, perhaps to uh, Venezuela. It's, it is very strange to see that uh, in Latin America, uh, Marxism in various forms, new forms, uh, has revived, and certainly they should come to our countries and then. Uh, well, talk to us, basically. Uh, but uh, yes, I think uh, there is, well, we all believe in, in Europe. And uh, certainly, a uh, disunited Europe, whether unable to stand up uh, to any threat uh, coming from any other direction, uh, or uh, a fundamentalist Europe, uh, uh, a fundamentalist, uh, whether Islamic uh, or, or in general dictatorial. Uh, Actually, a uh, loss of faith in democracy is, I think, uh, a, not a real danger perhaps in Western Europe, but it is a real danger in Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, I don't think that uh, the so-called extreme right is really such a danger now. But if poverty uh, continues, and if this uh, continuing uh, uh, kind of gap between the standard of living uh, of uh, not only between Western Europe and Eastern Europe, but this enormous difference in, in income and, and wealth. And in, in the former communist countries, uh, we cannot even say that people inherited their wealth or they earned it with their hard work and with their uh, inventions. It is through connections, through bribery. Very often, the Western companies are also to be blamed for this bribery. Uh, so uh, this is, uh, of <coughs> course, uh, the best way to fight uh, populism uh, when you, on the one hand, uh, uh, somehow uh, fight the causes of it, and also education. Uh, we, the media, uh, the media has of course an enormous responsibility, mm -hmm. and when uh, our media feeds people stupidities and, and uh, a very low standard, then of course uh, all kinds of uh, strange ideas uh, can be also be not, not the economist. Well, look, well, actually we need good economists, uh, and uh, well, it is up to yeah, you. Yeah, we Please. need a good economist, but not the economist, you know. Yes. <laughs> okay. Marcus. Marcus okay. I'm, hap I'm happy that the question of democracy, building trust in democracy, in education is mentioned, so I, uh, it's needed not to repeat it. I, I repeat my other point. It's a question of Europe. I really think that the European project is a crucial one for the next uh, two decades. Uh, and we can lose together including Great Britain, including the next government, uh, or we can win together. And only if we really develop a common foreign policy, common behavior in the global situation, we will win and the, this century uh, will be a century with Europe as a player. If we are not able, we can forget <laughs> us. And I think one point which makes me trouble is the question which policy in this field will Great Britain have in the future? Um, to be frank, this, in my view, is a crucial point uh, for all of us uh, in Europe at all. Uh, second point is um, we have to deal, what you mentioned, to deal with past in order to find future. I think really that's a question of uh, to find a consensus about communism. It's a challenge for us in Europe. We have a common understanding uh, about national socialism, uh, including Germany, and that's very important for all of us. But I think we have to develop a common understanding about communism, how to deal with that, and we have to confront in a friendly way, but insisting again and again 
that, for instance, memorial with Sakharov Prize, it was very important that the European Parliament did it to give memorial, a Russian initiative, this prize, because it's crucial for all of us, including for Russia. Um, and so I think this will be an important point. And so to give a wish, I would like um, Great Britain's support uh, for a museum about the Cold War uh, in the center of Berlin at Checkpoint Charlie, because I think it is important that we have a European, including transatlantic museum, a place to remember that situation, especially for the youth. I am afraid that they don't understand why the revolution was necessary. Thanks very much. We'll, we'll be taking coll collection afterwards for the founding of this, <laughs> for, the, for the enlightenment of the British Conservative Party and secondly for the museum at uh, Checkpoint Charlie. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Jan Czernikowski. Uh, first to far right, uh, it is a funny competition uh, occurring between Hungary and Slovakia uh, because both countries have a tendency to, uh, to, uh, to say about another country that, yes, you have far to right. Change. And uh, I told you, uh, I haven't. I, haven't yes, yes, I don't think, <laughs> tell about our two. Uh, and uh, that, that's why each country must be crude, uh, strong uh, on, uh, upon its own far right not to be uh, accused by, an, by another country. So uh, Slovakia, in Slovakia, Slovak government maybe, and president is uh, telling, yes, in Hungary there are Hungarian guards, and it's far right, and, and you are bad and bad and bad because you have that. And the, uh, yes, and no, not only because of uh, our accusations, but uh, hung Hungary has, uh, uh, yes, uh, declared it uh, non uh, under law and uh, under uh, put on trial, etc. The a similar similar uh, group we have in Slovakia as well, and we we do the same. And uh, the the group was uh, forbidden, uh, but then the Supreme Court decided otherwise, and so the government is doing it uh, another way. So in th this way, it is a. I would say, funny competition between two, uh, the, these two countries. Uh, to Slovakia, funny right. Yes, there is such groupings, but it is not is socially uh, isolated or not important. It is not representing, uh, represented in any, any elected body, uh, from national parliament to some local, local uh, council. And to this, our dreams for the next 20 years and our nightmares that are different uh, sides of, of the same phenomenon, I would say that, and maybe in Britain it ca is, cannot be understood quite well, but Central Europe was the whole 20th century the dividing line of the, uh, of the biggest uh, split and competition, etc., of the world. In, in Berlin, when in 61, uh, American and Soviet uh, tanks stood against uh, each other, it was a very, very dangerous situation for the whole world. And now such dangerous situation for Central Europe has ended. It's, Central Europe is a is peaceful, peaceful region of the world. Now the dangerous uh, region is uh, Middle East, far, uh, Middle East, uh, broader Middle East, etc. Iran, uh, Israel, maybe, etc. Et so we are uh, suddenly we Central Europeans are living in in the situation uh, almost borrowing because we do not feel the tension and pressure we are used to for whole lives. Thank you. Well, I, I remember... Uh, so it should last. <laughs> Václav Havel once said his great aim for the then Czechoslovakia was that it should be a small, boring country um, <laughs> in the middle of Europe. And um, I, uh, I, I don't think anyone listening to our discussion tonight could say it's, anything's got that boring. But I'd like to give you the last word. 
I shall answer um, more as a writer than as a politician. I think that there are, um, there are two kinds of enemies, uh, nightmare and butterfly. And I, uh, my nightmare is, for example, short seeing perspective, <coughs> egoism, individual egoism or collective egoism. And butterfly is hope, is responsibility for, for the world, is long term thinking about many different problems of contemporary civilization. I don't know, um, I am not like Marx who, uh, who knew everything and uh, who um, was able to predict future. I don't know what will happen with this humankind, but um, uh, I only, um, I only um, think that there are two big possibilities that win the butterfly or win the nightmare. Okay. Thank you very much. That's up to me. Now, So you're, you're going to get a chance to clap. You're going to get a chance to clap properly in a minute when I ask you to. Um, but I'm, I, I request the organisers, if you can all please. St I know LSE is an incredibly egalitarian place, and nobody is more important than anybody else. But I've been asked to ask you to stay in your seat so that the um, ambassadors and the panelists can get to the reception first, which will then mean we'll be well prepared for you when you arrive. So please just give us a chance to um, get out before otherwise we'll be bottled up in the in the green room for ages. Um, I'd now like to ask you to join me in thanking all our panellists um, for their contributions, particularly to Václav Havel uh, for speaking in his excellent English. I don't know what the fuss was about.